Welcome fellow recovering traditionalists to episode 204, Timed Math Activities. Good or bad? Welcome to Build Math Minds, the podcast, where fidelity to your students is greater than fidelity to your textbook. I'm your host, Christina Tonnevold, the Recovering Traditionalist and BuildMathMinds.com founder, where my mission is to change the way we teach elementary math to our kiddos. So are you ready to start building math minds and not just creating calculators? Let's get started. Today, we're diving into a controversial topic in elementary math education, timed activities. There has been so much backlash to timed activities in elementary math over the last few years, but I'd like to bring your attention to a recent document that might have us all rethinking timings in math class. The backlash started because of all the anxiety and trauma that timed math activities induced. But here's the thing. It wasn't the activities themselves that caused harm. It was how we use them. Now, I was guilty of it myself, but I've always had this thought that we shouldn't just go completely away from them. So I'd like to propose a new way to view timed activities in elementary school. In the past, we used to use them as a way to punish students who didn't meet these arbitrary benchmarks. We kept kids inside during recess. We excluded them from celebrations, all of which made them feel like failures. That's where the trauma and anxiety came from. Not from those brief focused practice sessions itself. It was around the stress and everything around them and the punishments. Today, I wanna help you see how research-backed timed activities can actually support your students' math fluency when implemented thoughtfully. And I'll be answering some real questions from educators who are wrestling with what to do now that they are seeing students become thinkers, but they're struggling with quick retrieval of math concepts. Let's start with what the research tells us. In the 2021 practice guide put out by the What Works Clearinghouse and the Institute of Education Sciences, it gives timed activities a strong level of evidence for building math fluency. They analyzed 27 studies involving over 4,300 students, and the results were clear. When done right, timed activities work. But here's the key part in that. When done right. The WWC outlines five essential steps that you need to have in place for timed activities to be effective. I want to walk you through each one because this is crucial so that we do not go back to the old ways of doing timed activities, back when it was not done right. Now, first off, why am I promoting timed activities? I want to give you a little bit of insight just really quickly. If you've been around for a while, you know my focus is building number sense, building number sense, building number sense. But you've also heard me talk about three pieces that make up fluency. Accuracy, efficiency, and flexibility. I talk a whole lot about flexibility, but the other two are still important. Kids do need to become more efficient with their strategies. So timed activities is just one way that they recommend to help kids become more fluent. And becoming fluent means all three of those pieces. They do need that efficiency piece. Okay, so let's dig in to those five essential steps to make sure that we're building efficiency the correct way. Step one is that we should be using timed activities on already learned topics. This is crucial. Timed activities should never be used to introduce new concepts. Therefore, building fluency on skills students have already learned through other instruction. Think of it like this. You wouldn't time someone when they first learn how to solve a Rubik's Cube, right? You wait until they've developed understanding. Then as a way to practice their strategies for solving it, the timings help encourage them as they see themselves getting faster and faster. That same principle applies to mathematics. Okay, step two. 
choose short activities, and set clear expectations. Here's where we need to break out of the old worksheet and stopwatch mentality. Timed activities are brief. They're usually one to five minutes, so you do need to actually time them, but they don't have to look like the traditional time tests of the past. So let me give you some alternatives. First one, math talk speed rounds. So you give students 45 to 60 seconds to generate as many whatevers, and I'll give you an example here, as they can. So for example, set students up in partners and they have 45 seconds to go back and forth stating equivalent fractions to one half. If one of them can't come up with an answer, then when it's their turn, they kind of lose that round. Or if you want to make it more collaborative, they work together to list out as many equivalent fractions as they can during the 45 seconds. For younger students, an example is to have them spend those 45 seconds going back and forth with a partner, drawing as many different visuals for the number seven as they can. So the idea is to have them get as many whatevers, equivalent fractions, drawings of a number, whatever you come up with, strategies for a certain problem, in that 45 minute, 45 seconds to a minute, okay? Another example is to create scavenger hunts that are timed. So one example could be where you post math facts all around your classroom in sticky notes. And then students have three to five minutes to solve as many of them as possible. And they move around at their own pace. They might not get as many as somebody else in the room, right? This can be done individually or you can put it put them into pairs. An alternative version is to give each student or pair a specific answer that they are searching for in their scavenger hunt. So they go around and search at all of the sticky notes and on their paper they write down which facts they found around the room that give their answer that they were looking for. Another timed activity is to have kids race, but race against themselves. It's a race against yourself. Students complete a set of problems and then record their time in a graph that they keep in their own personal notebook. Then they try to beat their own personal best, right? The focus is on self-improvement, not competition with others, and there's no punishment like staying in at recess or not getting to have this, the ice cream party with the rest of the class if they don't reach a certain benchmark. The thing we want to promote is positivity and encouragement and encouraging them to do better than the last time that they did that, okay? Another activity for timing kids is to do a beat the calculator. So students try to solve mental math problems faster than their partner who gets to use a calculator. Now the key to this one is to actually use problems where mental math strategies are faster than the calculator. Okay. The key to timed activities is to use variety and engagement, not just rows of problems on a paper. Make it fun. Encourage your students. Don't punish them if they don't get to a certain quantity of, of problems correct in that time that's allotted. Okay, We want to encourage them to do better than they did last time. Step number three from the What Works Clearinghouse is to ensure students have efficient strategies before you time them. So this addresses a question from an administrator who has seen teachers slowing down to build up students' number sense, but then students are struggling on those timed assessments. Now, I really dislike that all educators and students are judged on standardized tests that have a timing component. However, that is the reality. And truthfully, here is the thing. Remember, students need to become more efficient. They need both conceptual understanding and procedural fluency, which means they do have to have efficient strategies. Understanding is important, but so is speed. So before you give any timed activities, number one, ensure your students actually have strategies to begin with for that concept. So if you've laid the foundation, you're taking it slow, you're helping them build their flexibility and strategies. Once they have those, then we've got to implement some layers of timed activities to increase their efficiency. The goal is not mindless memorization. It's helping students access their strategies quickly and confidently. 
Okay. So step number four from the practice guide says to track progress and set goals. So again, this kind of ties back to the activity I gave before, but we really don't want students comparing themselves to each other or to arbitrary benchmarks. Like you have to get 60 problems correct in 60 seconds. That's, that's not where we want to go. Get that out of our mindset. But we do want to help them keep track of their own personal growth. So have students chart their scores over time, try to meet or beat their previous score, and this one also addresses another educator question that I received about students not doing well on computational portions of assessments. When students see their own progress, they start to develop confidence and persistence. They're not competing against unrealistic expectations or standards. They're growing from their own starting point, and that is super powerful in anything we are trying to become better at in our daily lives, not just math, okay? So another key part of the practice guide and the recommendation about timed activities is step number five, which is providing immediate feedback. Research shows that immediate corrective feedback is essential. This means we can't just be marking their papers right or wrong later it means we need to be helping students fix errors right away and explain, explaining why the correct answers make sense. I like to golf, but I'm not very good at it. So when I go out to play, I'm really only practicing my bad swing. We don't want that for our students in mathematics. If they are doing something wrong, they need to know it immediately. Like when I see my ball fly off into the other fairway, right? All right, they also need instruction on how to correct it, which is what I don't get when I'm out there golfing on my own. I don't have somebody next to me coaching me along and telling me how, what I should try and did I think about this and giving me that corrective feedback and instruction, the instruction piece. The corrective feedback is I know it's wrong, but the instruction piece of what needs fixing and how I can fix it and where to go from there is the part that's missing. So we need to include those for our students. So another, um, a great tool, I guess I should say, I don't know if it's great, but I don't mind digital tools, games, and other programs online to help your students with timing and to just give them practice, right? It gives immediate feedback right away. They know whether they're right or wrong, uh, but remember, it doesn't really instruct, instruct them. So if you're using digital tools, you need to choose the ones that do provide immediate feedback and please understand their purpose. They are just for practice. That's it. They're practicing things that the kids should already know. They aren't building conceptual understanding inside most of these online programs, and they're not giving a whole lot of instruction typically. And if they are, it's pretty much direct instruction, not building conceptual understanding. So take a look at them, understand their purpose, and if it's useful for the purpose you have, then go ahead and use them. If you're using paper activities, review their answers immediately as a group, small group, individually with a kid you're working with, and focus on strategy discussion rather than just whether or not the answers are right or wrong, okay? Now, let's address the big elephant in the room, the assessment pressure. As I said earlier, I've heard from educators whose students perform well on conceptual and application type tasks, but they're struggling with com computational speed on those standardized assessments. So here's what the research tells us. Regular, supportive, timed practice actually reduces anxiety over time because it builds their confidence. Students who have frequent low stakes, low stakes, they're not stressed that they're going to have to stay in during recess, okay? Remember that low stakes opportunities to practice fluency perform better when they get to those high stakes assessments. Even though we don't like those high stakes assessments, they're still a part of our world. So the key is making these activities, the timed activities, routine and positive. All your other activities are, so just embrace these timed ones in that same fashion. When students know what to expect and they feel supported, timed practice becomes just another tool 
in their and our math toolkit. So here's my challenge for you. I want you to reflect on your current beliefs about timed math activities. What experiences shaped those beliefs? Then try just one supportive, fun, timed activity with your students. Focus on growth, strategy use, and celebrate progress. No punishment, right? Celebration, motivation. That's what we're looking for. Remember, it's not just about speed for speed's sake. It's about helping students access their mathematical knowledge more efficiently so that they can tackle math problems with confidence and speed when they need it. So here's a reminder of some of those time math activities that you can try out this week. Do the math talk speed rounds, maybe a timed scavenger hunt, have the kids race against their self. So do the first timing this week and then a week or two later, not every day, folks, let's get rid of those mad minutes that we used to use. Don't bring those things back. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. And then the final one was beat the calculator. All right. Try one of those out. Let me know how it goes in the comments. Until next week, my fellow recovering traditionalists, keep letting your students explore math, keep questioning, and most importantly, keep building math minds.